Hello, everybody. This is Lucas. Um, I am here to talk about your virtual lab article number two. Okay. Um, before I start, I hope everyone is uh, staying healthy, staying safe. Okay. Um, this is a pretty packed article. Okay. So please bear with me. Pause the video if you have to. Okay. Um, that's the cool thing about these videos. You can pause it whenever you want <laughs> and write down the information. Okay. So I'm going to start right now. The lab article number two. The effectiveness and safety of high intensity interval training in patients with type 2 diabetes. So here's a little outline I have. Okay. Um, I just broke it down into the sections that the article already listed. And that would be introduction, traditional exercise approaches, what is HIT, the health benefits of HIT in people with type 2 diabetes, recent advances, so less HIT, same effect. Is HIT safe? Putting HIT into practice. And just a conclusion to wrap it all up. So let's start with the introduction. So physical activity and exercise. So we know there's there are health benefits that come with physical activity and exercise. And that is an increase in cardiovascular risk profile, increase in energy balance, increase in physical uh, psychological well-being, immune function, strength, and flexibility. Now, if you're not physically active or exercise, you have a low cardiovascular fitness, and that is associated with uh, that's a risk factor for chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and that's what this article is about, and obesity. We know through exercise training, though, that is the most effective way to increase cardiorespiratory fitness. Now, specifically for people with type 2 diabetes, it helps with blood glucose control, and exercise training can be a type of therapy to help with prevention, management, and treatment of type two diabetic and its associated complications. Now, exercise training, okay? We know that a single bout of it can increase some insulin sensitivity up to 48 hours into recovery. We also know that it can, there's improved glycemic control for individuals with type two diabetes. Now, the exercises though, can vary with intensity, duration, and type. So there's no defined exercise strategy for improving, blood, blood, uh, for improving glucose control and cardiometabolic risks in type 2 diabetes. So the purpose of this is to discuss recent evidence that focuses on the potential for low volume, high intensity interval training to be safely implemented as a time efficient exercise option for decreasing blood glucose levels in individuals who are at risk or have type 2 diabetes. So traditional exercise approaches, or I like to call T. <laughs> so traditional exercise guidelines focus on increasing low to moderate intensity in physical activity for sedentary individuals. Now the American Diabetes Association and the ACSM, or the American College of Sports Medicine, okay, guidelines for physical activity recommend 150 minutes a week, all right, or it's 30 minutes for five days a week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Now, specifically for people with type 2 diabetes, resistance training is helpful. Um, and two to three sessions of resistance training per week with no more than two days off between sessions. Now, some activities though include walking, jogging, cycling, and anything to increase your heart rate. Okay, so according to these guidelines though, anything to increase your heart rate is something that uh, when, you, when you're working at 40 to 60 percent of max aerobic capacity, Okay, or you should be roughly around 55 to 70 percent of maximal heart rate. Now, both aerobic and resistance training exercise show improvements in glycemic control, and a combination may be more effective. And there is potential evidence of added health benefits with more vigorous exercise. Now, there's a meta analysis that looked at the impact of exercise training on A1C and type 2 diabetics. They found that exercise intensity is a stronger predictor than exercise volume for improvements in blood glucose control. Now this speculates that traditional guidelines focus on low to moderate because activities of daily living or ADLs like walking can easily be achieved. But such activities misrepresent individuals with type 2 diabetes and there's evidence that self-selected walking pace during exercise may be too low to achieve exercise training health benefits. Now, supervised exercise training Utilizing more vigorous exercise 
could be more effective in increasing cardiorespiratory fitness and lowering hyperglycemia in, in those individuals with type 2 diabetes. So what is HIT? HIT is alternating between bouts of vigorous exercise and periods of rest or recovery, so-called on-off period or pattern. Now, this allows individuals to form, perform more vigorous exercise due to the breaks in these periods, okay? And you can see that right here. So there's the on portion, and then there's the break off portion, okay? So that's the start of the exercise. That's the rest part. So various HIIT protocols have been studied involving different number of bouts, intensity levels, and lengths of intensity portions and or recovery periods. But multiple variables make it really hard to study. Now HIT may represent an ideal strategy for adding vigorous exercise intensity to individuals that aren't accustomed to that intensity. And the intensity of the vigorous bursts are based on the individual cardiorespiratory fitness level. Now, for example, for the on portion of the HIT, for a healthy individual, that may involve running or sprint cycling. The same relative intensity for an overweight type 2 diabetic might involve a brisk or uphill walk. This is cool because tailored can, uh, sorry, HIT can be tailored to the individual's relative intensity. So it doesn't have to involve an all out exercise. Now the health benefits of HIT in people with type 2 diabetes. Now I broke this section off into, or yeah, into different subsections. So I'm gonna be talking about high volume HIT, low volume HIT, and then long term low volume HIT studies, and then I'm gonna conclude it. So let's start off, high volume HIT. So there are several studies that have tested the HIT protocol of four by four minute bouts of uphill walking at 90 to 95% of maximal aerobic capacity with three minutes of low intensity walking rest. Now when compared though, to constant moderate intensity walking at 65% aerobic capacity, it provides superior cardiovascular benefits. Now there's also a recent meta-analysis using participants with lifestyle related metabolic disease and they reported an increase in CRF after HIT and is almost doubled than that increase in CRF after continuous moderate intensity training, okay? So what this means is that, yes, you're gonna get benefits from both HIT and continuous moderate intensity, okay? But what is the magnitude? The HIT is that of doubled, okay, of just the continuous moderate intensity training. Now, other benefits that were found to improve were endothelial function, insulin sensitivity, and blood pressure. High volume HIIT. Studies directly compared HIT to modern intensity exercise in people with type 2 diabetes are less common. For example, Karstoff et al. found superior effects of HIT using interval walking compared to moderate intensity continuous walking in patients with type 2 diabetes. Of participants he used, they were roughly 60 years old. It's been an average of five years since their type 2 diabetes diagnosis. Most treated with diet only or metformin and had no history of diabetes complications. Both groups trained for 60 minutes a day, or five days a week, for 16 weeks. Their HIIT protocol, three minute intervals at roughly 70% of maximal aerobic capacity with three minute rest bouts in between of low intensity walking. Now the continuous protocol was 60 minutes at roughly 55% of maximal aerobic capacity. Now what they found is that the interval walking group had greater improvements in body composition aerobic fitness levels, and glucose control. Low volume HIT. Now there's a rise in data showing that low volume HIT can obtain improvements in cardiovascular and metabolic health. Now this involves a lower exercise volume and time commitment. So theoretically more time efficient. Now perceived lack of time though is the number one barrier for exercise adherence. And this might be a more advantageous option to increase physical activity levels among individuals, right? So, because who doesn't want to work out less but achieve the same amount of benefits, you know? So, one low volume HIIT protocol 
has, deployed, has displayed promising preliminary effects in type 2 diabetes. The participants were roughly 65 years old, obese, so they had BMI above 30. They were not on exogenous insulin, and they were free of diabetes complications. Their protocol was 10 by 1 minute vigorous intensity bouts at 90% of max aerobic capacity with 1 minute rest periods. Now they trained for 30 minutes a day for three days a week for a minimum of two weeks. And they should roughly have like six total exercise sessions per 14 days. Now what they found though, is that there was a reduced 24 hour mean blood glucose levels in previously inactive participants with type two diabetes. This is the figure that they show, okay? Figure A is the average 24 hour blood glucose assessed before and after six sessions of HIIT program, okay? And B is a representative 24 hour continued glucose monitoring curve from a participant assessed under standardized dietary conditions. Um, what I'm unsure of that they didn't really explain in the article was if on um, chart B, I don't know if this individual was in the study or I don't know if they are comparing an individual from a different studies to their mean 24 hour blood glucose concentration. I am unsure. But nonetheless, you can see though that post hit, there was significantly less um, blood glucose in, uh, sorry, blood glucose levels, okay, which is pretty cool. All right, and you can see that here in A for pre post. You can see that right here for pre hit and post hit levels on a 24 hour period, okay? So it's hour by hour as well. It's pretty dope. So Shaban et al. assessed an even lower volume protocol than the one we just talked about. Now, his participants, they're roughly 40 years old, okay? So a lot less of a, um, there's a lot a bigger year difference than the previous one. The majority of them were eight, eight out of nine were taking exogenous insulin. It's also a small pool. Um, and all were free of diabetes complications. The HIT protocol was four by, three, four by 30 seconds at 100% maximal aerobic capacity with four minute rest times. So that's four bouts, right? 30 seconds each bout and all out exercise, okay? Now it's not like all out, you know, like for a healthy individual, that like an all out could be running as fast as they can. But for let's say someone um, with type two diabetes, an all out might be a super steep uphill walk, okay? Now the findings though, that they found where blood glucose level was immediately decreased after each section, session, there was no difference in fasting insulin or glucose after six sessions in two weeks, and six out of nine participants saw improvements in insulin resistance. Now, this HIP protocol may be a useful strategy for improving metabolic control. So long-term volume, long-term low volume HIP. So long-term studies of low volume HIP in type 2 diabetics are limited. Metronome et al. studied 12 weeks of HIT or continuous exercise in 43 subjects with type 2 diabetes. Participants were 50 to 70 years old on glucose lowering medication, but not taking exogenous insulin, and were free of diabetes complications. The HIT protocol was, that he used was six by one minute intervals at 85% of max aerobic capacity with four minutes of low intensity recovery. Continuous exercise protocol was 30 minutes of just continuous exercise at 65%. And what they found was that both protocols showed improvements in body fat mass, cardiorespiratory fitness, endothelial function, and fasting blood glucose. But the benefits were much higher in the HIIT group. Also, A1C only increased post HIIT, which is interesting. So, health benefit conclusion. The underlying mechanism by which HIT improves glucose control may be seen in its ability to recruit more muscle fibers while also depleting muscle glycogen stores. And that promotes post-exercise muscle insulin sensitivity. Due to the increase in sensitivity lasting for roughly 24 to 48 hours post-exercise, it may be an effective strategy for acute and chronic glucose control. Now, participating in a HIT program over an extended amount of time, roughly 12 to 16 weeks, may also have the added benefit of lowering abdominal adipose tissue and increasing lower body muscle mass. Recent advances. Less hit, 
same effect. It can improve multiple markers of health with individuals um, with or at risk of type 2 diabetes. The components of obtaining the optimal HIT training are still unknown. There is growing movement in HIT research to see what is the minimal amount of exercise to increase cardiometabolic health. There is one protocol with promising evidence, and that's as little as one minute of vigorous exercise performed in a 10 minute training session. And that's three sessions, roughly 10 to 20 seconds for three days a week for six weeks. Now what they found was that this can improve glucose tolerance in overweight men, especially in individuals with type two diabetes. So is it safe? Is HIT safe? Well, vigorous exercise has been associated with an increased risk of acute cardiovascular events, okay? And there's a safety concern for a HIT program among any clinical population. There is no evidence that HIT is the same continuous, uh, that is the same as continuous vigorous exercise. And there's a recent retrospective analysis of 5,000 patients, there should be an extra zero there, sorry, over seven years of supervised cardiac rehabilitation exercise was conducted. They reported a low risk of acute cardiovascular events with HIT. Specifically, there was one non-fatal heart attack per 23,000 hours of HIT training. At this time, it is recommended that individuals with type 2 diabetes who want to start in a HIT program must undergo proper pre-exercise screening, undergo a 12 lead ECG stress test. Okay, um, hopefully when all this stuff clears up and you know we're allowed to go back to school, um, maybe next year in 460 we'll have a couple clients who need an ECG stress test. Okay, I've done a couple of them; they're very exciting. Um, they must be accompanied. Oh, sorry, they must have a physician's clearance. They must be accompanied by a certified exercise specialist or certified exercise um, physiologist. When clear though, there must be an appropriate warm up and cool down period to reduce the participant's injury. Now, a majority of the studies examining HIT in patients with type two diabetes have been short durations. Okay, so roughly less than six months. And most of the individuals are around 60 years old, treated with metformin, plus one other glucose lowering drug, free of coronary artery disease, and had been cleared for exercise. So what about the applicability of HIT for different subgroups within type 2 diabetes? That is unknown. The only study though, to the author of this article I'm summarizing, okay, to the best of his knowledge, there was one research article that did this. And that was done by Prayet et al, where HIT was examined in type 2 diabetics um, with complications. Participants were roughly 60 years old with insulin, treated type 2 diabetes, and diagnosed polyneuropathy. HIT protocol that they used was four to eight bouts of 30 seconds cycling sprints with 60 second rest for 10 weeks. And that was added on top of a resistance training protocol. And then what they found is that there was an increase in fitness, decrease in hyperglycemia, and exogenous insulin requirements. Um, but there was one overuse injury that isn't clear whether it was HIT related or resistance training related. So putting HIT into practice. HIT can be a useful tool for any exercise program, regardless if it replaces continuous moderate exercise due to time constraints or it's added to traditional exercises. The most effective interval structure is unknown, but intervals ranging from 10 seconds to four minutes at greater than or equal to 70% of max aerobic capacity has been proven to be safe and effective in clinical populations. Now, depending on the fitness level and experience of the participant, it is recommended to have a progression of either interval duration, the intensity, or number of bouts. But this can also be done by adding, picking up the pace to a session of continuous and moderate intensity exercise. For example, someone who's not used to it, okay, you can have them do um, a light walk or jog at let's say 4.5 miles an hour, okay? And then maybe every minute, increase it by 0.1 miles an hour, okay? Or increase it by 0.2 miles an hour, 
All right, so you're slowly picking up the pace, so you're building them up. Now, exercise intensity can be prescribed by using percent of heart rate max and RPE scale. So heart rate max can either be assessed by a stress test or what you've all done in the past is estimated it by 22 months age. For example, someone who is 50 years old has a max heart rate of roughly 170 beats. Okay? Now, their interval exercise would be at 85% of their heart rate max, and that would be 145 beats. And usually, you can see whether they're getting accustomed to these bouts, okay? Um, roughly within like three to four intervals, okay? If those intervals are 30 to 60 seconds, all right? Now, the use of RPE scales, the category ratio 10 scale, um, rates overall exertion on a scale from zero to 10. 10 being very hard, very, very hard. Seven being very hard. Zero being nothing at all or rest. Now there are more numbers, but these are the main ones that matter. An intensity of roughly 85% of heart rate max correlates to roughly seven to eight on the category ratio 10 scale. There is a protocol of six to 10 bouts of one minute intervals at this RPE that has been shown to work among type two diabetics or pre-diabetics. So most studies use cycling or uphill walking to achieve desired intensity. And intervals can be any type of movement as long as the on portion is increasing the intensity from the off portion. Possible exercise modalities include walking, cycling, swimming, team sports such as football, soccer, circuit training, or resistance training exercises. Francois et al. did a study on HIT comparing two HIT regimens. The first one was a one minute interval switching between resistance band exercises and treadmill walking. And then two was just HIT training. So his findings were that regimen one was just as effective as the second one at reducing blood glucose for 24 hours. And alternatively, heart rate was lower, but RPE was much higher for the resistance band group. And who knows, that could be due to, they're not just going from like, so the just hit treadmill walking. So I can speculate probably that they're on the treadmill walking and then they stop walking. And then for the first regimen, they're literally doing the one minute intervals like of band exercises and then another minute interval of treadmill walking, okay? so. RPE could be a little higher due to the fatigue that's building up the, um, when they're doing the resistance band exercises. Who knows? Oh, sorry about that. Conclusion. So there is evidence to support the potential for cardiometabolic benefits of HIT among individuals with type 2 diabetes or who are pre-diabetic. And most studies had a relatively small participant pool and short in duration. More research is needed to understand the safety and efficacy of HIIT programs before implementing into training. And for individuals who are cleared for vigorous exercise, it may be a great addition to exercise training regimens to increase health benefits. All right, everybody, that's the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you all are gonna stay safe. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, if you need me, please email me. Um, I'm trying to be as quick as I can. That being said, have a wonderful day. Bye.